Hey folks, I'm attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Welcome to our coverage of the Kim Potter manslaughter trial over the April 11th, 2021 shooting death of Duante Wright in a suburb of Minneapolis when then police officer Potter accidentally used her Glock 17 pistol in place of her intended taser. Today saw four jurors seated in this first day of jury selection. Two prospective jurors were dismissed using peremptory strikes, one by the state, the other by the defense, and the remaining five jurors questioned today were dismissed for cause. Now, before I jump into the meat of things, I do want to briefly mention an exceptional opportunity for your consideration. Perhaps once every 12 or 18 months, we do one of our full-day Law of Self-Defense Advanced Self-Defense Law classes. This is a full-day class. It's the equivalent of a law school seminar on self-defense law, applicable to all 50 states and taught in my usual plain English style without any confusing legalese. This class is taught live by me, streamed to you at your computer using Zoom, and there's plenty of opportunity for live Q&A with me during the class. Because we allow for Q&A, however, we have to sharply limit the number of seats available, so on the rare occasions when we do one of our Law of Self-Defense advanced classes, they invariably fill up almost immediately after we announce the date, and we've announced the date for this one. It's taking place on Saturday, January 8th, 2022. If you've ever wanted a true mastery of the Law of Self-Defense, here's the best really among the only opportunities to grab that expertise with both hands. Again, seats are already going fast, so if you're at all interested, I urge you to grab your slot today. Okay, folks, with that out of the way, let's talk about the trial participants and the procedure taking place today. Uh, the presiding judge in this trial is Judge Regina Chu. The prosecution team consists of Attorney General Keith Ellison himself, the state's attorney general, who was personally present in court today. The lead prosecutor is Assistant DA Matthew Frank, who was also a member of the team that prosecuted Derek Chauvin. Interestingly enough, in the same courtroom, where Kimberly Potter is being prosecuted. Accompanying Frank is Assistant DA Aaron Eldridge, whom you may also recall from the Chauvin prosecution team. And finally, there's Assistant DA Josh Larson, who I'm not familiar with. The defense team consists of attorney Paul Eng, who appears to be lead counsel, accompanied by attorney Earl Gray, and attorney Amanda Montgomery, who appears to be present in largely a support type role. The procedure being used by the court for jury selection is to bring in panels of roughly 10 prospective jurors at a time. These are given the general jury instructions as a group, speaking to such things as the burden of proof, reasonable doubt, and so forth. Then the panel is excused, and those jurors are brought in one at a time for individual voir dire with more specific questioning, first by Judge Chu, then by either defense counsel Ang or Gray, they alternated, and finally by assistant DA Frank. This more specific questioning was to a large degree based on the 13-page jury questionnaire that each member of the panel had previously completed. I won't spend time here on the jurors who were dismissed for cause because they're no longer relevant to the trial. Instead, I'll summarize the voir dire of the four jurors actually seated with video of each of their voir dire embedded in the text version of today's content. Also, I'll touch briefly upon the two jurors that were dismissed using peremptory strikes, as that decision by each side may also provide some insight into the dynamics of this trial's jury selection. Now, one alarming facet of this first day of voir dire is that Judge Chu informed the jurors that she hoped to have this trial over prior to Christmas. But if that did not occur, she would recess the court for the Christmas holiday. She also notified the jurors that if they were seated, they should expect opening arguments to kick off the trial proper the morning of Wednesday, December 8th. That's next Wednesday. Personally, I much hope that the two and a half weeks between December 8th and Christmas will be enough to put this trial behind us. As we step through today's voir dire, it's worth remembering that every juror has been subject to the usual campaign of propaganda that accompanies such trials, starting immediately after the event on April 11th, through the riots and looting that followed, and continuing through the almost eight months that bring us to today's proceedings. That being the case, almost all come to jury selection with an existing negative sentiment to Defendant Potter. That doesn't necessarily disqualify them from sitting as a juror so long as they are able to set that pre-existing bias aside and render a verdict based solely on the evidence and law provided to them in court. So the first juror seated today was juror number two, uh, presented as an older white male who described his work as being a technical editor of biology science journals of some sort. 
In questioning by Judge Chu, it was revealed that in his jury questionnaire, he had indicated that he was neutral towards Potter, but also that he didn't understand why an officer would attempt to disable a driver of a moving vehicle when doing so could result in injury to others. He also felt very unfavorable towards Blue Lives Matter, perceiving it not really as an effort to support the police, but rather merely an effort to undercut Black Lives Matter. In questioning by defense counsel Gray, juror number two indicated that he'd be prepared to judge the case based on the evidence and argument in court and that he wouldn't do so until he'd heard the defense as well as the state's presentation of their case. Juror number two also indicated that he didn't believe the justice system was fair in the sense that people with greater access to legal resources will always have the advantage and he won't get any argument on that from me. Gray wisely pointed out that in this case, it was his client, the defendant, Kimberly Potter, who had the more limited resources relative to the prosecution. In questioning by Assistant DA Frank, who conducted all the voir dire for the state today, juror number 12 indicated that he believed in the need for police reform, but that he was opposed to the notion of defunding the police, having said in his questionnaire that he strongly agreed that the police in his community helped keep him safe. After only about 15 minutes of voir dire, juror number two was seated on the jury and told to report back the morning of December 8th for opening statements. The next juror seated was number six, who presented as a woman of mature enough years to have four adult children, one of whom sadly had predeceased her, and who was a retired school teacher. Unlike the roughly 15 minutes spent on voir dire of juror number two, questioning of juror number six took a full 40 minutes. In questioning by Judge Chu, juror number six conceded that she came to the trial with a very negative impression of Kimberly Potter, but also a very negative impression of Duante Wright, finding fault on both sides. She also noted that sometimes the criminal justice system seemed biased, for example, in cases where the makeup of the jury did not reflect the diversity of the community. She also noted that she was aware of cases where it had initially seemed the person was guilty, where they were convicted. And then later, more information is discovered, and we realize the conviction was wrongful. Alarm bells went off for me here for the defense when juror number six described how she's a retired teacher who gets her news information and analysis from national public radio. Neither of those sounds favorable to the defense for me. It was in questioning by defense counsel Eng that we first learned that the defense intends to have their client, Kimberly Potter, the defendant, take the witness stand in her own defense in this trial. I expect this is really unavoidable given how many of the jurors, including this number six, came to this trial wondering how such an experienced police officer with 26 years on the job could have failed to distinguish between her Glock 17 and her taser. Where the questionnaire suggested that perhaps police officers should not be second-guessed about decisions while on duty, juror number six strongly disagreed, saying their training should hold them to a high standard and failure to adhere to that standard deserves second-guessing. It's hard to disagree, really. Eng followed up on this issue by ensuring that juror number six was prepared to be open-minded when she heard testimony on the training Potter had actually received. Juror number six also expressed a strong preference for increased gun control laws, although she appeared to understand little about guns, had never owned one, had fired a shotgun once 50 years prior and never tried it again. This could be a real problem for the defense if this were a non-police shooting, but presumably even juror number six would concede that police need to be armed. Curiously, when the defense was done questioning juror number six, Judge Chu immediately informed her that she would be seated on the jury, forgetting that the state had not yet had a chance to question her themselves. As you might imagine, the state pointed out the error, and Assistant DA Frank was given his opportunity to question juror number six. He asked her to confirm that she would evaluate the testimony of defendant Potter no differently than she would any other testimony from any other witness, and not give Potter's testimony inherently greater weight because she was a police officer at the time of these events. Because juror number six also came to the trial with a negative impression of Duante Wright, Frank also focused on ensuring that she was aware that it was Potter, not Wright, who was on trial here. After 40 minutes of this, juror number six became the second juror seated on this trial and told to return on December 8th for opening arguments. Juror number seven presented as a youngish male who works as a night shift manager at a Target distribution center and who came to the trial with a somewhat negative view of Potter. 
Based on his initial view of the video of the event, he felt it was quote unquote kind of clear what happened, but he also professed to be open to new information and to change his opinion if warranted. In his questionnaire, it turned out that juror number seven claimed to have once owned a taser himself. Although on further questioning, it became clear this was more an inexpensive press stun type of device, which in any case he'd had taken by Canadian Customs on a trip some years prior and had never bothered replacing. Defense counsel Earl Gray conducted the defense voir dire of juror number seven. Here, juror number seven was asked about his questionnaire response that he was slightly distrustful of the police and he responded that this was true, but he also recognized that police had a very hard job he wouldn't be capable of doing himself. And when he needs police type help, he himself reaches out to the police for that help. Asked about his thoughts on the criminal justice system, juror number seven paraphrased Churchill to note that it may not be perfect, but it's the best we have. Assistant DA Frank once again conducted the voir dire for the state. This questioning didn't take long, and I don't have many notes on it because not much happened. But in any case, after 30 minutes of voir dire, juror number seven was the third juror seated and told to return on December 8th. And that brings us to the fourth juror seated, juror number 11, who presented as a woman who repeatedly characterized herself as a rule follower. In a remarkable exchange right out of a lawyer joke book, Judge Chu asked her about an event described in her questionnaire in which a friend of hers was killed, as in murdered, in a fatal stabbing attack. Judge Chu then asked, did this friend recover from this stabbing? Uh, Judge, you just used the phrase fatal stabbing yourself. I'm not sure how one recovers from a fatal stabbing. In any case, Juror 11 naturally answered uh, no. Judge Chu then followed up with, So he or she is still in very bad physical condition? Judge, fatal stabbing. (laughs) Fatal stabbing. Juror 11's response was straightforward. Uh, No, she passed away with no apparent sarcasm in her voice, whatever. So she's a better person than me, I guess. Then Judge Shu seemed surprised that the friend who had been the victim of the fatal stabbing had passed away as a result. So this bit is less than a minute long, so it's quite funny, brief enough that I'll embed it right here. Now, you stated that a friend or family friend was a victim of a fatal stabbing in Minneapolis, and it was a close friend. Um, Were the police called in connection with that? Yes. And what was your, were you there at the time it happened? I was not. Okay. How long ago did it happen? It's been at least five years now. And uh, did this friend uh, recover from the stabbing? No. Um, so, so he or she is in still very bad physical condition? Uh, no, she passed away. From the stabbing? Yeah. Okay. Now, Attorney Gray conducted voir dire of juror number 11 for the defense and Assistant DA Frank for the state, but nothing much came of this except they both agreed that juror number 11 was acceptable to them. And so after about 30 minutes of voir dire, juror number 11 was seated as the fourth juror in this case and told to report back on December 8th. Now, I'd like to touch briefly on the two prospective jurors who were dismissed today based on peremptory strikes one by the state, one by the defense, because I think it shows some insight into the decision-making of the two parties. Juror number eight was a retired firefighter, rank of captain at retirement, who presented to my ear as an extremely reasonable, unbiased, open-minded juror. I won't spend much time detailing his voir dire because he is stricken by the state's peremptory, and so he's no longer relevant to the trial. I would, however, encourage you to view the roughly 35 minutes of video because And that video, like all the video, all the voir dire I've discussed here, is embedded in the text version of today's content. Because this very reasonable prospective juror proved to be just the type of juror that the state does not want seated, and upon whom the state used its first peremptory strike. Now, curiously, at first, Assistant DA Frank informed the court that juror number eight was acceptable to him. I thought he was going to be seated, but then there was an abruptly called huddle of the prosecution team after which the decision was made by the state to strike juror number 11 using a peremptory. Next, we have juror number 15. So in contrast to juror number 11, juror number 15 presented as a youngish woman who was fully woke indoctrinated, who came across as an aggressively uh, political activist loon trying to lie her way onto the jury. 
Judge Chu noted that juror number 15 had actually worked in the campaign to elect Attorney General Keith Ellison, who was leading this very prosecution. But juror number 15 assured the court that she could nevertheless be unbiased. Defense counsel Ang would note in his voir dire of her that number 15 had actually smiled at Ellison in happy recognition when she saw him in the courtroom. Further, Ang noted her questionnaire described her interest in seeking societal accountability in a world of systemic racism. But in court, she claimed that although the entire system was racist, she wouldn't hold that against the defendant, who was, let's face it, the enforcement arm of that system at the time of these events. Ang also led juror number 15 to reveal that if she had a personal friend who was considering becoming a police officer, she would question them about that choice and ask if such a career was quote, really consistent with their moral values. She further characterized Blue Lives Matter as a calling card not for supporting the police, but rather for radical right-wing white supremacists. No anti-police bias there, I guess. Juror number 15 also favored adopting a gun control scheme in America modeled on that of Japan. Despite all this obvious bias and a sidebar conference with Judge Chu, it appeared the judge was unconvinced by the defense to dismiss juror number 15 for cause, and the defense was obliged to use a peremptory strike to remove her. Okay, folks, be sure to join us again tomorrow morning at Legal Insurrection for our ongoing live coverage of this trial, including real-time commenting and streaming of the trial proceedings, and then again at day's end for our analysis of the day's events. And that's really all I have for all of you this evening. So until tomorrow morning, remember, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun, so I'm hard to kill. My family is hard to kill. Then you owe it to yourself and your family also to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict. Until tomorrow morning, I remain Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.